Okay, uh, hello to everybody. I'm going to talk to you about comets, how they can be connected to the origin of life. Uh, this will be focused mainly on the results we obtain on uh, cometary samples um, that were brought back to Earth by the Stardust Space Mission and also on another uh, experiment that we are uh, improving in our lab, which is Duster, which is collecting dust from the stratosphere. Uh, let's see the outline of the lecture. I'm going to speak about the connection of comets and the origin of life, a theory that sees that look at comets uh, like uh, uh, objects that somehow participated to the process of the origin of life on Earth. And then uh, I will, we will see together from where cometary dust is coming from and so why the connection uh, can be considered among the origin of life and this object that can be primitive or primordial. We will look um, through this. Uh, then we will speak about the Star Wars mission. Uh, there will be a short movie uh, that will show you the scenario of the uh, space mission. And then we will talk about the Duster experiment. And then just uh, a slide to look into the future. Uh, we know that for the origin of, of life, there are three ingredients uh, that had to be there when life started on, on Earth. These are water, organic molecules, and an energy source. With these three ingredients, one can go through the starting ingredients to the uh, life, going uh, on, let's say, following the experiment performed by Miller, uh, that uh, considered all the three ingredients being on the Earth when everything started. And then there is another theory that look, uh, look at, looks at these uh, ingredients as coming not only from Earth, but also from outside the Earth, so some extraterrestrial origin. And the, let's say the, the, the object that somehow brought is ingredients on Earth, some of these, uh, were uh, probably comets. Why? Because if we see the arrow of, of the times, just on, in the bottom of the slide, we can see that there is some connection in time among, let's say, from the very beginning, Earth formation can be dated somehow 4.6 billion years ago. And then after the the after this period of, of planetary formation, there were a big instability, gravitational instability in the solar system. And so a lot of small bodies uh, impacted on bigger planets. In particular, there was a, a maximum of this, what, how it's called, cometary bombardment, uh, which is dated at about 3.9 billion years ago. And all the stratas of life in rocks are dated among 3.8, 3.5 billion years ago. So the time connection among these two events and the maximum of cometary bombardment should have been a period very um, not so comfortable, let's say, for such a delicate um, process to be started. Uh, it uh, brought uh, scientists to think that there was maybe a connection among these two events. And let's say, let's see uh, why comets uh, among all the objects of the solar system and from where cometary uh, dust is coming from. Let's start from the very beginning, so 13 billion years ago from the Big Bang, the universe formed. And then uh, from uh, this homogeneity uh, present at that moment, galaxies 
form. And within each galaxy, I'm showing you a spiral galaxy here, which is similar to our galaxies. And uh, within this, each galaxy, there are some regions that are formed by dust and gas. These are the dense molecular clouds that uh, in, in which some primitive amorphous material is present. And this is the region where uh, actually uh, all the stars formed and as the other stars also our sun formed. In fact, in this uh, very dense agglomerate of dust, the uh, process of the star formation can occur. It starts and then it, it becomes like a protoplanetary nebula around the star and the dust and the, and the material um, surrounding the star is getting together, aggregating, forming planets. And it has to be noted here that in these big molecular clouds by infrared and astronomical um, radio and infrared astronomical observations, uh, more than 150 types of organic molecules uh, were detected. So let's see that already from here we start looking at some one at least of the ingredients which is necessary for the beginning of life on Earth. And concerning comet, uh, let's say the, the going from this molecular clouds, dense clouds, to solar system formation. Uh, somehow these organic molecules should have uh, been there and remained there. And in particular, if we want to look for some very uh, primordial material, we have to go in the, at the very edge of the solar system because there is the region which remain cold and the uh, bodies that form are quite small, so non-active. So they represent like a photograph of the condition we had at the very beginning of the solar uh, system formation. So comets form, uh, in fact, at the very edge of the solar system and they can have a primitive component which is coming directly for, from the uh, dense clouds and they can and they are surely primordial formed by primordial material where primordial I mean the material that was present at the very beginning in the protosolar nebula because they form at the edge of the solar system and they remain there even if we will see later that stardust results could tell us something a bit different from this after the cometary sample analysis. So stardust. Stardust is uh, a NASA mission that was designed to reveal some secrets also about the connection of comets and the origin of life on Earth. I will now show you a movie which is uh, giving you the, the scenario of the mission uh, quite clearly. This is, the, um, this is the target of the Stardust mission and uh, that was chosen um, also because it did not pass close to Earth until 1974. Um, that it was the day when Jupiter's gravity changed its orbit. And because it has not been exposed to the sun at, at close range, its composition has not been altered, altered so much from its original condition. So material was primitive. And, uh, and then by the time of the Stardust encounter, Commodore Wheel 2 made only five trips around the sun. Okay, let's see the movie.
Stardust, bringing cosmic history to Earth. Comets are believed to be the most ancient objects in our solar system. Made of ice, dust, and carbon, these celestial beacons are thought to hold secrets to the early formation of the planets and the sun. When far from the sun, a comet's nucleus is cold and its material frozen solid. As the comet travels towards the sun, the ice begins to warm and the materials begin to evaporate, forming an atmosphere called a coma, creating an enormous tail which fluoresces in sunlight. One of these cosmic interlopers, Comet Vilt 2, was the destination for Stardust. NASA's Stardust mission is managed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in partnership with Lockheed Martin and the University of Washington. The ambitious goal of this mission is an historic journey that will bring back to Earth the first ever samples of a comet. This 850-pound spacecraft was launched on February 7, 1999, aboard a Boeing Delta II rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida. After five years and 2.1 billion miles of travel, Stardust encountered Vilt 2 on January 2, 2004. As Stardust neared the comet, the spacecraft deployed its collector grid to capture particles of the comet. This tennis racket looking device contains over 100 ice cube sized compartments filled with the world's lightest known material, a silicon based substance called aerogel. These comet particles, moving at six times the speed of a bullet, collided with the aerogel. With a heavier substance, the comet particles would have vaporized. But the light aerogel served to slow down the particles capturing for scientists these microscopic clues to the formation of the solar system. But catching the comet particles required more than aerogel. The spacecraft had to do its part to soften the blow of capture by lowering its speed at time of encounter. Still, Stardust was traveling 13,000 miles per hour when it passed through Vilt 2's coma, coming within 149 miles of the comet's nucleus. At such close range, the possibility of a larger piece of the comet colliding with and destroying the spacecraft was a genuine concern. For protection, shields were installed on the front of Stardust. Like a battering ram, the spacecraft made its way safely through the coma. Shortly after encounter, the collector grid was stowed inside the sample return capsule for the two-year journey back to Earth. Another mission objective was to take close-up images of Comet Vilt 2. Using a camera similar to those on NASA's Voyager spacecraft, Stardust delighted scientists with spectacular images of the comet's surface and features. By the time Stardust returns to Earth, the spacecraft will have logged 2.9 billion miles on its seven-year journey. That will give Stardust the NASA record for the farthest distance traveled by a solar-powered spacecraft. As it nears home, Stardust will refine its flight path with a series of maneuvers. Once in the proper position, the spacecraft will release the sample return capsule with its precious cosmic cargo. The next stop is Utah. The capsule will plunge into the Earth's atmosphere at nearly 28,000 miles per hour, one of the fastest re-entries ever undertaken. The friction of re-entry will dramatically raise the temperature of the heat shield, creating a glow in the early morning western sky. 20 miles above sea level, a small drogue chute will deploy, further slowing the capsule. 
Six minutes later, the main parachute deploys, carrying the sample return capsule to a soft landing within the Utah test and training range. After recovering the capsule, the comet samples will be transported to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where scientists will first open this treasure trove of new information. NASA's Stardust mission, helping scientists to unlock the secrets of the early formation of the solar system and our Earth. By exploring comets, we will discover the mysteries of life and beyond, as only NASA can. Okay, um, the panel that the Stardust spacecraft um, exposed to the to the coma of Comet Wheel 2 was made of uh, many aerogel blocks. This is a very uh, peculiar material which is which has the lowest density, uh, um, the, the lowest possible density for a, for a solid material and uh, in, in it was uh, chosen and selected just to be able to um, stop the entrance of the, to, to stop the, the grains of the cometary dust, uh, trying to uh, modify uh, the least as possible the cometary dust when entering uh, at a velocity of six, six kilometers per second. So the material had to be uh, low density, but as well had to stop the grain when entering in it. So this was the material chosen and, and now we see the light track of the of the probe containing the cometary sample that was coming back to Earth and landed in the Utah desert. And here they are they found the, the, the little uh, capsule uh, by helicopter and the capsule was brought back to, to the Johnson Space Center, of course, in a clean room. In fact, contamination issue, as you can imagine, is very, um, is very one ha had, has to take it in, in, a, in a big consideration just to avoid any contamination of the sample. And, uh, and they opened the probe and at the very first glance they could see some of the grains that uh, impacted in the air gel and were trapped inside it. Inside it. Uh, here we see a block of this air gel with a, with a trap in it. The grain was coming into the block from here and it formed this type of, of track which is enlarged and zoomed in uh, on the on the right, and as you can see, this is uh, what it was called a bulk track, uh, which is formed probably by uh, the grain that was containing uh, quite a lot of um, of volatile material. So when impacted the aerogel, it it goes like uh, blowing up, and uh, and the and the aerogel was modified as you see uh, here. And many tiny pieces of the particle can be found around all this track. And then at the very end, there is what is called the terminal particle. In this case, it's about 50 microns. And, uh, and um, what we saw uh, with the analysis is that at the very end, the, the particle was composed mainly of minerals and not anymore of, uh, for instance, uh, instance carbon ash material or the volatiles that were uh, loosened at the very beginning of the track. Uh, this is one type of the track, but then we we had uh, actually many types that were formed um, in different shapes uh, depending on depending on the on the type of material that 
uh, that was um, the, the grain was composed of. In fact, if the material was uh, uh, mainly a mineral, then the track would have um, that would have formed was something like this. Uh, it was called like a carrot like and uh, no bulb at the, at the very beginning of the track was present. Uh, here um, upright you see different uh, samples of particles that were uh, collected at the very end of the track. So these was, were, but that were called uh, terminal particles. Uh, after uh, the Stardust samples came back to Earth, NASA um, gave these samples for the very preliminary analysis to about 200 researchers um, of, of, of all over the world. And uh, we started the investigation of the samples in a, let's say, closed phase of analysis uh, just to see the, the very um, preliminary results and to understand uh, how these samples uh, were uh, formed and the composition, the morphology, uh, depending on the technique that uh, was applied. In particular, uh, for what concerns our group, we uh, asked for, um, for seven grains that were extracted from one of these bulk uh, tracks uh, the 35, and, in, and this was because we were, of course, interested very much in the analysis of the organic component of the, of the cometary material. So uh, this is the reason why we chosen a, a bulk track. And in fact, uh, and then we um, applied three different techniques on the grains that we uh, received by NASA. Uh, and the techniques are uh, micro infrared, micro Raman spectroscopy, and um, uh, field emission scanning electron microscopy with ADX analysis for chemical composition. Here I'm showing you also another track from which uh, we, uh, um, uh, from which NASA extracted the grains from uh, a second uh, that assigned us. Um, after a, a second successful uh, proposal presented by us. And then here is the third track uh, for which actually in this case we asked for terminal particles. And I will show you the difference among these grains collected from different uh, uh, tracks. Here uh, I'm showing you what we found with uh, infrared spectroscopy on the on the particle uh, extracted from the bulb track, and in fact we could uh, we could see from the infrared spectrum the GH band uh, testifying that organic molecules were were present, and we could um, uh, retrieve the ratio among CH2 and CH3 band, which uh, give us an information on the shape and the, and the characteristic of these molecules. And in fact, uh, what we could conclude uh, was that, uh, that uh, these molecules that we detected uh, were um, actually uh, similar to what was uh, seen also in the diffuse interstellar medium, but the, the, the molecules were longer and less branched uh, aliphatic chains. Uh, the ratio of CH2 and CH3 uh, was similar to what we found in interplanetary dust particles, more than interstellar material. Uh, so, and this is one of the of the items that leads the preliminary examination team to conclude that uh, in comet uh, the comets are mainly primordial and less primitive. So what is found actually is something which is close to the solar uh, nebula, but not so much to the interstellar component. Um, 
Then here I'm showing you what we got as an example is field emission scanning electron microscope image of one of the particles up right. And in this case, it was quite interesting because from infrared spectroscopy, we could um, uh, combine with, with, uh, e uh, from, with scanning electron, electron microscope EDX results, uh, we could conclude that uh, it was prob probable the presence in, in this strain of phyllosilicates containing calcium, aluminum, and sodium. And this is an important uh, issue in support to the cometary aqueous alteration. Uh, okay, here I'm showing you the grain of the second track I showed you at the, at the very beginning. And uh, uh, just to let you understand how samples are prepared. Our, our techniques, the techniques that we applied are non-destructive in this case, in this case. Um, and the advantage is that after our technique are applied, uh, then other scientists, other groups can apply further investigation with other techniques to know more about the same grain. And here you see in the dark spot here, this is an optical microscope attached to the infrared, uh, micro-infrared spectroscopy. Um, and here you see the, the white uh, spot is the aerogel. Of course, when we were measuring uh, the grain, we had to have something like um, a reference of the aerogel, which is, of course, unfortunately, giving a contribution uh, to, the, to the measurement we performed on, on the grains, that everybody performed on the grains, because the aerogel had a lot of qualities, but it's true that uh, somehow the grain uh, were uh, like contaminated by the presence of the aerogel because the aerogel was not possible to be completely removed around the grain. Um, and now here, this is the preparation, uh, a bit different from the from the first two sets of grains. Of, uh, of the grains extracted uh, from the, the more carrot-like carrot uh, -like, um, track. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, analyzed two terminal particles, what we called here TP2 and TP3. You see the, the dimension uh, were 11 microns in this case and nine microns in this case. And what we decided to do uh, to, let's say, with the aim of uh, get rid of, of the, as much as possible of the aerogel uh, uh, that was present around the grain, and also to, uh, let's say, uh, enlarge um, the, the dimension of the grain, the, the surface that we were looking at, we pressed this grain inside what is called a diamond cell. Um, two diamond cell, each grain in each diamond cell, uh, and this allowed us, as you see here, to um, to smash the grain and obtaining them in with another shape. But uh, the, the aerogel on top of the grain was uh, a bit uh, less, and also the surface that was uh, flat. Uh, with respect to the beam of our different analytical techniques was improved. And here is uh, here are the results that we got with these other techniques. As I said, these are terminal particles. In fact, we expected not to find any organic component, and this is in, in fact confirmed. And we could reconstruct like a map of the brain which is, um, here you have the legend, so you see that the, the, the calcium domain, which is this white spot, this white spot here, uh, could be interpreted as low calcium pyroxene or sub micrometric inclusion of calcium rich compound. And then the yellow domain is the sulfur and nickel, and it's surely represented by iron nickel sulfate sulfide inclusion. And then there is the green domain, 
which are uh, composed of aluminum and sodium plus calcium domain that could be interpreted as interpreted as a plagioclase or a melilite. Uh, finally, there's a purple domain, which is uh, surely olivine, and this is not uh, it, it, it is well expected to be founded on, on comets. And uh, the empirical, so it's the empirical formula is shown here. And then again, for the second brain, we could reconstruct the composition uh, by the combination of field emission scanning electron microscope and NDX analysis. And I have to say that all these results were uh, somehow confirmed by the other two techniques infrared spectroscopy and microraman spectroscopy. Uh, something more general, a result which is not coming from our group actually, uh, it's by Elsila et al, 2009, by in uh, meteoritic and planetary science um, uh, paper. Um, in this case, they they got very nice results because they could detect actually the uh, trace of glitting, uh, which uh, so are uh, let's say they were oh, of course they, they 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 can illustrate that um, the potential delivery and survival of amino acids to the early Earth by comet. Uh, and then summarizing all the stardust finding, not not all, but uh, main stardust star, uh, findings uh, till now, we can say that um, the large, from one to ten uh, micron crystalline grains of phosphorite, anthracite, plagioclase, and iron nickel sulfides are common. Uh, abundant high temperature minerals anorthite, dioxide, spinal, etc. are present. Um, cometary grain are weakly constructed mixtures of subgrains of various sizes and compositions. And the 10% or possibly more of the comet mass was transported somehow outward from the inner region to the so to off to the to the edge of the solar nebula as particles larger than a micron. So this is a very nice result that improves the study on cometary formation. Uh, in fact, uh, finding minerals that are high temperature minerals, this means that these minerals form like inside your orbit of mercury, and then they were somehow ejected outside uh, the solar system, at the edge of the solar system, where they aggregate uh, to form uh, the, the comet. So all this is testifying a huge mixing in the early solar nebula. Uh, as an example of the, of the, um, uh, of one of the grains, I'm reporting here uh, an eight micron grain which has three major components, the sulfate, pyrotite on the left, and then the three uh, micron enstatite grain upper uh, in the middle, and then the fine grains, here there is a mistake, of course, it's not millimeter, but it's micron, and then the fine grain porous aggregate material with convertic element of composition. So as you see, there is a, a very big disomogeneity in one single grain of eight micron in diameter. Uh, high oxygen and uh, nitrogen content and also a high ratio of CH2 and CH3 indicate that real two organics are not similar to those found in diffused interstellar organics. Real 2 material is highly crystalline, structured rather than amorphous, and isotopic anomalies show the presence of pre-solar materials, but it is rare. So Will 2 does not seem so primitive in the stellar, but rather primordial. So it's 
giving a picture of the solar nebula. Now, to resample the term mission, which are the advantages? Of course, we can use state-of-the-art analytical techniques that it's also improving year by year, but the samples are always there and available to be analyzed with improved analytical techniques. Research, uh, resource uh, for current and future studies by broad community. Of course, the samples, as it happens for startups, can be distributed all around the world and studied by uh, a very broad scientific community. Uh, the analyses are iterative and fully ad adaptive, so the results are not limited by instrument design or current scientific ideas. And it avoids limitation associated with spacecraft cost, power, and mass because the measurement and analysis are performed on Earth. Analysis can be replicated, verified with multiple techniques and calibrated. And instrumentation as I said, improved over time, so the, the samples can be reanalyzed. But it is also true that three um, uh, per ten to, to the four tons per year interplanted dust particles, mainly of cometary origin, origin fall on Earth. So collecting interplanted dust particles in the Earth stratosphere is a very low cost possibility, possibly cometary uh, sample return mission. And uh, in addition to this, there is uh, in, in the stratosphere also a very, very rare and important component can be collected, the, which is the interstellar component, which is giving us a picture of the, could give us a picture of primitive material and these components, as well as the interplanetary dust particle, can be collected in the stratosphere. In fact, um, the, the presence of interstellar material, material in Earth vicinity demonstrated by Ulysses Cassini and other interplanetary missions, and uh, um, measuring the present composition, of course, could would give indication on unaltered condition outside our uh, planetary system. So we, with the aim of collecting dust which can have also a stellar component in our university we developed duster which is dust from the upper stratosphere tracking experiments and trial and uh, this is done in collaboration with the University of New Mexico Professor Rick Meyer and uh, the responsible are, were the previous uh, principal investigator was Palumbo, and now the present principal investigator is De La Corte. And this instrument is devoted to, as I said, collecting dust uh, in a size range between 0.1 and 10 microns. And the, the, this, this dust is collected in the Earth's upper stratosphere. And is uh, compatible. The, the, the instrument is compatible. The, 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 the design is compatible with the collection also of the interstellar component. And the, the operational cost, of course, it is quite low. And the management of following analytical work for the best data exploitation. Um, the Dr. Flight uh, campaign were performed in Kiruna, Sweden in 2006, and then uh, from Svalbard in Norway uh, in June 2008, and then again from Svalbard in 2009, and then uh, the last one uh, was performed in Kiruna uh, in 2011. And uh, let's give a look to the, to the flight performed. Uh, of course, the first one was just a qualification uh, flight, so I will not talk about that. Uh, but I will show you some results on the other three flights. Uh, the first one was a standalone flight, uh, which started from, you see here the trajectory, it started from Svalbard, went up to an altitude, a sampling altitude of 
37 or 38 kilometers. Uh, and it samples uh, six meter cubed of, uh, of air and collected dust uh, on, the, on the ad hoc design substrate that I will show you later. And then another flight again from Valberg, in this case was quite uh, longer. It starts from Valberg and then it was recovered in Baffin Island and the, uh, the sample uh, air volume was in this case 32 meter cubed um, uh, of air. And then finally, this is the last flight in 2011. Uh, it was performed at about a bit more of, uh, it was 31 or to 33 kilometer sampling altitude and uh, 3.6 meters cubic of sample of uh, air was sampled. Uh, here again, just a glance to the to the first uh, flight, which was not a scientific flight, but here I'm showing you what is very uh, special of Duster, which is the sample holder. The sample to avoid contamination uh, as for Sardis given by the mean of collection, we use uh, this, um, this substrate that are uh, very clean and very well, um, uh, let's say we, we characterize the surface very well by scanning electron microscopy before flight. And then after flight, uh, we identify the particles really collected in the stratosphere that are not contaminated by any means because there is no need of, of sticking material on them. So the, these substrates are directly, uh, when the, the data is open in a clean room, then they, they are directly uh, positioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the apparatus where we have to perform the first analysis, which is a scanning electron microscopy. Um, okay, here, just to show you for the results we obtain, uh, this slide and the, the following ones, uh, what we collected in the 2008 flight. Uh, here, an example, of, an example of the particles typically collected. These are really very small particles. Uh, it's like 0.5 uh, uh, micron about, and also this is a very small one. And the nice thing in this case was that we could um, identify like a family of collected particles that was showing a similar composition, but very a morphology, very much and structure, very much differentiated. So in, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just uh, giving you an example of the low resolution image and then the high resolution image. Uh, and in this, these two uh, images are uh, zoomed in some of uh, some pecu peculiar morphology present in, in this brain, in this brain. And then the, the analysis to check for the composition. And as you can see, the calcium peak is very much um, it's, it's important in this case the, the content of the of calcium is quite high uh, and this as also in the other particles that were collected so the interpretation of this collection of this uh, let's say family was that uh, it's it's like um, because of the different morphology we can uh, we can uh, we, we could observe, uh, we could observe uh, these grains like this that are mainly minerals, but then some of these went through some, some kind of heating process. And then in this case, the, the, this, this, this particle, so they, they were partly processed for, for this family here. And then in this case, these are particles that uh, from the morphology, one can conclude that they were condensed. So the material evaporated and then we condensed from this chemical composition and morphology observation. We could conclude that, um, that the, the particle were actually um, 
belonging to a, a unique body. Uh, it, it was a, like a fireball that entered the stratosphere, uh, the, the terrestrial atmosphere, and then exploded somehow, and uh, some of the material uh, evaporated and recondensed, and uh, and uh, and some of, of of the material remained uh, instead unprocessed. And the 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 from the temperature and the composition and the and the, and comparison with models, we could uh, conclude that the 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 the, the 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 body that entered the into the Earth's atmosphere uh, was probably of cometary origin. Okay, let's go to the 2009 flight uh, results. Uh, in this case, we were not so so lucky. Here, I'm showing you the, the collection chamber that is, of course, assembled inside a clean room. And then here is the, the launch of a very, very big balloon. In fact, in this case, Duster was not a standalone flight, but was mounted together a very uh, big payload of uh, some tons. And uh, and unfortunately, the, you see here the, 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 the wall payload and that there was just on, 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 on the top of this big payload. Here is the parachute uh, after landing in, uh, in uh, Baffin Island. And you see here that that there was not so in a good health when, when I arrived back because there was a, a delay in the recover of the big payload because of the weather. Something happened to the batteries, leaking batteries of the main payload, and so the um, the, the fire um, uh, fire started on on the big payload, and and also um, uh, the, the, there was like um, a shifting of the payload, and and that went went upside down, and and it was like crushed by the big payload. But uh, likely the chamber was still there and quite intact, apart from the fact that the valve had uh, a leaking. So some of the material that we found inside are uh, like contamination. So we have to do a lot of big work, work to um, disentangle the, the stratospheric components uh, from uh, contamination. Here I'm showing you this is the typical uh, aggregate of, of smoke, condensed smoke due to the fire. Uh, okay, let's go, oh, let's ship this and we will go to the data collection of 2011. In, in this case, it was very a very short uh, collection flight but it was quite interesting because we could uh, find uh, this uh, um, object that I'm showing you that the analysis of the rest of the collection is still ongoing but what we are quite interested in is in presence of this organic uh, object. It should be like a virus, we have to um, to go in depth to understand which type of virus is, um, but uh, of course we we have to 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 perform a lot of this is just a very preliminary result I'm showing you, but it is interesting that we could collect something of biological um, uh, origin in in the upper stratosphere, but we will go through uh, this in more details in the future. Okay, so just to conclude now, uh, let's give a look to the possible future extraterrestrial dust collection. Uh, this, we think, will contribute to clarify the origin of life on Earth. There will be a next dust campaign in 2013 um, that will, we hope, collect interplanetary possibly, probably, hopefully, uh, the interstellar dust that is coming through the atmosphere while uh, Earth is moving uh, through, the, uh, through the, the galaxy. 
And then we have uh, another mission, which is the NASA mission. It's not uh, yet selected, actually, but this is planned to uh, bring back that from an asteroid. And uh, so uh, let's see how it will go, if it will proceed. Of course, it will be very interesting also to study uh, material coming from, from an asteroid. Uh, again, from a, from a, also from an astrobiological point of view. And then finally, we are also participating to, to a proposal which will be submitted to, to NASA in the, in the future that will again uh, go on a comet and collect some sample and bring it back to Earth for further analysis from a different point. Okay, that's, that's all uh, I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there are questions, I'm ready to, to answer.